There has been a lot of talk about human rights in the news this week. Former Conservative Prime Minister Sir John Major warned against Rishi Sunak's alleged plan to leave the European Convention on Human Rights to ensure his plans to control illegal immigration can't be blocked. Also, the Scotland trans prisoner row continues, as the Scottish Prison Service said transgender prisoners will initially be put in jails corresponding to their biological sex. A recent review alleged that the transgender double rapist, Isla Bryson, being put in a female prison did not put female prisoners at harm. Some would argue that this policy from the SPS will infringe on the rights of transgender prisoners, although it's fair to say this argument has been severely weakened in the public's eye in recent weeks. But all this begs the question, what are human rights and is our current understanding of them based on fact or fiction? Now joining me to discuss this is historian and broadcaster David Starkey. David, what do you think of John Major's comments, should we leave the EHCR or the ECHR? Well, there was a very, very interesting remark by Sir Roger Scruton, the late, great Sir Roger Scruton, who said John Major was an experiment in having a completely uneducated prime minister. (laughs) And I think that John Major's comments illustrate the problem in having a fundamentally uneducated ex-prime minister. By uneducated, do you mean didn't go to Eton? I don't mean they didn't go to Eton. I mean that he has never had a serious abstract thought, that he has never shown any ability to debate. So he's not an intellectual. Any ability, any, so this really matters. Yeah. Politics is partly about the understanding of the practical world, the ability to deal with people. But fundamentally, politics is about ideas. What our program is about, what our discussion is about, it's about ideas. And if you get somebody with no sense of the world of ideas, actually in charge, I mean, remember what the prime minister is. He is in charge of the whole process of political debate, of political action. And when you get somebody with no sense, I'm afraid you get John Major and you get the consequences of John Major and you get the kind of Tory party, a party with absolutely no notion of what conservatism or indeed any other ism let alone human rights means. Well, I would say that experiment won over in the end. I wouldn't say that he was uneducated. I'd say he had no vision and had no ideology. And I think we've had the exact same situation since then. But we're talking about rights today. So do you think human rights exist? I think human rights or rights exist within specific legal systems. The great problem is when you come up with this bizarre notion of universal human rights. Now, you would be perfectly prepared and indeed I imagine have a notion that there is such a thing because you believe in a deity outside of our individual personal uh, uh, individual pers- personal historical cultures who embodies such things. I don't. I think that, again, if you look historically, I mean, so let me say, first of all, I, I think unless you actually believe in a deity, a universal deity, there simply can't be such things as universal human rights. I think, therefore, what we've got to do is to look at how the idea that there are such things comes into existence, irrespective of that notion of a universal beneficent God. And I think that there are two ways that we can actually begin to understand it. The first is the straightforwardly historical, the idea of uh, of a universal human nature and universal human rights is effectively developed in the 17th century by two uh, very great thinkers. It's developed by Hobbes on the one hand, uh, Thomas Hobbes on the one hand, and by John Locke on the other. And what both of them are trying to do, and this is the really interesting thing in terms of the debate we are having now. And you remember, you began with intense specificities about what's going on in Scotland, what's going on with Britain, uh, with the European Convention on Human Rights. And in both cases, Hobbes and Locke, the notion of universal human rights was designed to do one thing. It was designed to justify revolution. 
It was designed to give you a kind of external lever which enabled you to de demolish the existing structure of the state and put something in its place. So when Hobbes began writing in the 1650s, what he was really doing, he was trying to justify Oliver Cromwell. He was trying to justify the destruction of the monarchy of Charles I and its replacement with what we now see as the military dictatorship of Oliver Cromwell. What Locke was doing was speculating on how could you justify demolishing the monarchy of James II and putting something in its place. But what's really interesting, when we actually did demolish the monarchy of James II, when we put in place the uh, extraordinary enduring structures of the glorious revolution, which did include a Bill of Rights, as you should be telling me in a moment, we didn't appeal to universal human rights. We did everything we could to avoid it, and we instead pretended that we hadn't actually got rid of a king at all, that the king had absolutely voluntarily abdicated or they'd been chased out of the kingdom, and we preserved existing structures. Because it seems to me, again, if you look to 1945, when the modern version comes in, thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt, thanks to the Second World War, uh, thanks to the foundation of the United Nations, what you were consciously trying to do, and it's very simple, you were trying to justify the Nuremberg trials. And do you know what? It served its purpose, but it served its purpose at a terrible, terrible cost to the West. And the cost is what you've been seeing, what you've been illustrating with the fact we can't deal with the boat people. We have no rational grounds for saying this absurd creature with her floppy platinum blonde hair is or isn't a woman, why she shouldn't be in this jail, why she shouldn't be in another. We've lost as it were, what should be the fundamentals of the democratic control of the political process, because in instead we've erected this completely false category of universal rights, which can only be arbitrated between, well, by judges, by international courts, by things by that elite. are... Pardon? By the elites. By elites. And you know, this is why we're in the mess that we are now. And we need to recognize the fact that the categories are fundamentally wrong and misconceived. So I appreciate what you're saying about the revisionists using these universal rights uh, to readjust the, the, our vision of, of history and society. And even human beings and yeah. even gender yeah. and everything else. However... You're, and you're also right that I would point to not just Thomas Aquinas and his views on life and liberty, but also to the Apostle Paul and his views uh, on essential freedoms, not of individual liberties, but on our freedom to, to love God and to love each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. However, I would suggest that the UN in their convention weren't, weren't arbitrary. I would say they're pointing all the way back to the ancient, well, to the church fathers, but also to the ancient idea of property rights. I would say it suggests it perhaps goes further than Hobbes and, and Locke. The trouble is, you see, if you actually, there are two different ways that you can look at universal, that, that you can look at human rights. If you actually look, again, let's take the example of John Locke. Let's take the absolute key figure. Let's take the key figure of particularly, uh, although his ideas are not incorporated in the English Revolution, they're certainly incorporated in the American Revolution of the late 17th century. Locke's, I, what were Locke's universal liberties. They're very few. Life, liberty, and property. Yeah. These apply to everybody. Yeah. What we've done instead, following 1945, right. we started to produce intensely sectional rights. We started to produce rights of transsexuals, gays, me, and um, blacks, you. Um, and the problem with that is, once you actually start having sectional rights, the notion of rights is, this is what is so fascinating, it's inverted. If you actually look at what Rosa Eleanor Roosevelt thought she was doing in 1945, she thought, and indeed what Churchill, what, what the British were doing when they produced the first draft of the European Convention on Human Rights, what they thought they were doing was protecting you, me, every other individual against the overweening power of the state. Now, I, 
Essentially, that's the task of English common law. It doesn't need this vast superstructure. But what, we, what we've done and what, particularly under the pressure of the Soviet Union and the satellites of the Soviet Union operating through the international institutions of the European Convention on Human Rights and whatever, after 1945, what they did, they focused on small group rights. Mm. They focused on the rights of minorities. So you focus race sexuality, gender. Now, the moment you do that, human rights find themselves stood on their head. Rather than protecting the individual, they require huge apparatuses of state power. This nonsense in Scotland. Every ordinary person thinks that this woman who was a man, who was sort of... I mean, what I found, can I be really disgusting now? The photograph that really struck me, oh she was wearing tights, and you could actually see her penis Bulge, right. showing through. Yeah, that's now, because it's a bloke. Because it's a man. And it's a physical, endowed, functioning man. But everyone with common sense knows that it's and a man. And everybody with a common sense, unlike Nicola Sturgeon, knows that it is. And we are required to perform this lunatic, self-denying routine. Now, frankly, I think that the denial of reality is the basis of human catastrophe the moment you do that. Um, uh, so there's, an, there's an, a preposterous absurdity. But the broader obs absurdity is once you actually start having this minute series of this right, that right, the other right, and again, non-rights like the right to the right to a to accommodation, the right to the right to education, the right to this, that, the other. Do you know what you finish up with? You actually finish up with no scope for democratic government at all. Everything becomes a matter to be determined by judges, to be determined by committees, whatever. Um, and I'm sorry, this leads us in a position where the thing that was supposed to protect the individual that was supposed to protect freedom, above all to protect freedom, yeah. destroys it. It's anti-freedom. Yes. It's anti-freedom. Yeah. And we're in this we're in this bizarre cul-de-sac. I mean, a world that protects the rights of this creature is a world really which has gone mad. Well, because then there's a hierarchy of rights, isn't there? The right of women to be protected from well, sexual it's abuse. Very low on, it's very, very low on the scale of right. abuse. Again, the, the whole issue that, that's been brought forward with with prevent, with with the work that William Shawcross has been doing on prevent, the right of us to be protected against terrorism comes way, 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 way down against the notion that we mustn't have Islamophobia. Yeah. Um, similarly, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental notion that a, a state should be able to protect its frontiers comes way, 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 way down against the notion that as a high victim, you know, especially you know, somebody of an Islamic background allegedly coming from a country which the West has invaded, I mean, scores so many points. The moment again that you have a notion of victimhood as the arbitrator of rights, but who determines that order of victimhood well, is totally arbitrary. It's merely the chattering class. Well, it's not just arbitrary, it's absurd, isn't it? And well, think, it is often absurd. And I think people yeah. see that. So, But I think it's, to, I, I mean, can, can I just say that I think, let's put our case, as it were, at, at the smaller level rather than pitching it high. Let's just put it at the level of irrationality. All of this is in th all of this notion of rights is in theory an aspect of the enlightenment of the notion that reason is the proper medium by which we determine human relations. But this is this is a transgression of reason. It's a parody of reason. It's destructive of reason. But is that not good? Because it, ex it exposes itself and situations like this one in Scotland are going to resort in the SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, one hopes. in the polls. One hopes. They've ruined their chance of independence. Yeah, well, I, I mean, all of which I would applaud right. vigorously. But the trouble is what, I mean, let's pause, Calvin, in our, in our mutual, mutual delight <laughs> and collapse of this and ask another question. What goes in its place? Mm. Because see, once we've lost a notion of a, of, of a very different attitude to politics, which is to recognize that human beings are different, that there are very different kinds of political society, that, are, that we in Britain, I mean, 
can I just say that what I would like to do is to oppose the nonsense and the ignorance of John Major mm -hmm. against somebody who is a real figure, Zelensky. Okay. Um, his extraordinary speech in Parliament in the last day or so, uh, it wasn't in Parliament, it was to the assembled Houses of Parliament in, in Westminster Hall. What Zelensky did, he dared do something that no English politician could have done. He invoked Churchill without apology. He invoked our finest hour without apology. He invoked the Second World War without apology. He invoked a tradition of politics which was able to handle, which was Churchill, which was wide amb wild ambition, appetite for greatness and whatever, but to contain it. You've lost me now, David, because I'm not on board with all the Zelensky idol worship. Uh, I think Boris Johnson, not the best politician in the world, he would have invoked Churchill. Yeah, he would. Distortion. But jo Boris Johnson is a parody. But th this is the important thing we need to realise. There are the real thing and there is parody. Mm. And Zelensky is the real thing. How do you differentiate? Because there are many people that will say Zelensky is an actor, he's been he, given a script, and he is a parody too. No. A Zelensky is achieving. Boris Johnson was the parody. Boris Johnson is, is an echo chamber. He's a parody of Churchill. Zelensky is doing exactly what Churchill did. Or rather, he's doing something even more fundamental. Churchill actually had a nation, Britain, one of antiquity. Zelensky is part of that process of inventing one in the horror and the bloodshed and whatever. And he's also inventing it with hardly a real political tradition. What Churchill did was to invoke a continuing political tradition. And what I want to do, this is why I mentioned this, it seems to me that what we need to substitute for this absurd, irrational, pseudo, it's pseudo-rational yeah. doctrine of rights, we need to invoke our existing fundamental tradition of liberty. Mm. Remember, the European Convention of Human Rights was invented by the British, not because they thought they needed to apply it here, but effectively it was saying to the Germans and everybody else in Eastern Europe that had never had these things, this roughly is what you do. This is how you go about it. Um, and it's unfortunately, it's been reflected back the disastrous legalistic notion of Tony Blair and Jack Straw, that we needed to incorporate the convention into English law. And again, you know, people are so ignorant of this. The European court was never intended to begin with to apply to individuals. Right. It was intended to apply only to states. And this entire pattern of local jurisdiction, which has developed individual jurisdiction, is... I'm sorry, it is wholly artificial. We need to understand, I think, that the entire structure of human rights law as it's developed is flawed and is based on an irrational foundation, which is why it leads to you know, the absurdities of Scotland, why it leads to the absurdities that you can't stop illegal immigrants. Um, and, you know, well, I think I, right I, I, it has I, to be I, I, May I just answer? May I just end? I'd really like to end with this. Yeah. I end by quoting Jesus. Please do. By their fruits ye shall know them. Yes. And we see what the fruits of human rights laws are. They're universally catastrophic. I, I agree with you. And I will end by adding on, I think we have lost our identity and we've We've reached out to the UN Convention and other abstract ideas to replace our identity. The French know what they are. We've, we've lost what ours was. Our, the British Empire values were freedom, fraternity, and federation. I don't think many people would remember those values today. So even if we go back to, to Aquinas and life, liberty, and property, or, or Locke, we have to have something to fill that void. I think you're absolutely right. Thank you very much, David Starkey.